It's called a piezo buzzer, so don't expect great fidelity. In 1880, there was an effect called the piezoelectric effect that was predicted by two French physicists, Jacques and Pierre Curie. And they said, they found out that if you take certain types of materials and flex them or put pressure on them, what they're going to do is generate an electric charge. And then 1881, uh, the reverse piezoelectric effect was, was um, discovered or predicted by Gabriel Lippmann. And what it said was that if you put a charge on one of these piezoelectric uh, materials, that they're going to flex or change or warp or deform based on the strength of the electric charge and, well, the type of material. Now, we can take, a we can take advantage of this converse piezoelectric effect by making these little speakers or these little beepers um, speaker is really the wrong term because they ain't a speaker. They actually just generate vibrations that if you put these vibrations, and, and in fact, let's go ahead and draw out one of these devices. What you've got is your piezoelectric material. All right, and if you adhere that to perhaps just a metal plate, so you've got a metal plate. Whenever you put a charge on this piezo material, it's going to flex, which is going to, since it's attached to the plate, it's going to flex the plate. Now, if you do this fast enough, you can actually generate noise, generate sound off of this plate. Now, how are we going to do this? Well, these, these electrical signals that you put on these piezoelectric materials are in the form of a pulse width modulated periodic pulse train. Now, if you remember from our discussion about P, uh, PWM signals, you know that a PWM signal has two features that define it. One is the period, and we define that with a capital T, and the other one is the pulse width. So this is the positive going pulse width. And that is defined with a little t sub w. Those two in themselves define this periodic or this, this pulse width modulated signal or PWM. Now, a pulse width modulated signal, uh, PWM signal, um, we can change these two things. Now, in our code, we are going to find out that we have control of both of these, both of these characteristics of the signal. Now, for our period, what we want to do is define a period that is in the audible range of our speaker. You know, a speaker should be able to accurately reproduce sound in the full range of human hearing from what, down to like 50 or 100 hertz up to, well, 18,000, 20,000 hertz. Unfortunately, though, these little speakers don't have that range. In fact, it's pretty amazing that they have a range of more than about 50 hertz at all, because what we've got is this plate it has a size, a width, a length, or a circumference, uh, excuse me, a, a diameter. Um, it has a thickness, and it's going to have what's called a resonant frequency. And so we're interested in this thing called a resonant, resonant frequency. What is a resonant frequency? Well, a resonant frequency is something that, uh, a, a, uh, something like a plate or an electric circuit, it is its sweet spot. It is the point at which it vibrates best. And for each one of these speakers, there's pretty much a resonant frequency. Outside of that, you may get either a dampened sound, not necessarily the frequency you were looking for, or a harmonic, a completely different frequency as that metal plate is trying to attempt to vibrate as close to the resonant frequency as possible. So whenever we try and drive these little speakers, usually what you're looking for is a beep, uh, you know, something in the 
couple thousand to eight thousand hertz range. And that, if you take one over the frequency, that is going to give you your period. So that gives us the ability to calculate our period. The pulse width, well, that defines something, going back to our discussion about pulse width modulation, our pulse width defines something called a duty cycle. And so we have this thing called a duty cycle. And a duty cycle is measured in, it's a, it's a percentage, and it's the percentage of time that the signal is a logic one over the whole time of the signal. So it's really just T sub little w over T times 100%. All right, so we should be able to figure out these two things. If I want my speaker to vibrate, I'll pick a period or a frequency. I'll pick a period or a frequency that is going to correspond to the, the sound, the level, the frequency of the beep that I want to admit, emit. The duty cycle, however, is a little different. Whenever we're looking at how duty cycle is defined inside of the machine, typically it's defined as an integer, not the percentage. So, for example, it may be that for our particular script that the duty cycle can be defined from 0 to 255. Sounds like an 8-bit value, right? So, any, in other words, 8 bits, all zeros, or 8 bits up to 8 bits, all ones. Now, what this is going to do is our duty cycle, in this case, is going to be the, and I'm going to, let's see, let's see, the integer that we select divided by the max, well, the, the max size, so 255 in this case. So if I want to have a duty cycle of 50%, I'm going to select an integer of 127, or right around there, 128, 127. And that should give me a, an appropriate duty cycle whenever I'm trying to define the pulse width modulation using our script. Now, on the processors themselves, the processors themselves, many of them, especially ones that are set up to do uh, embedded system design, they have pins that are dedicated that, that have special circuitry that, that is, allows them to produce duty cycles and periods for a pulse width modulated signal. And so all it takes is to just simply send the parameters to that circuitry and it'll automatically generate the duty cycle for us. So how do we turn on and off the beeper? I'm going to recommend right up front, what we can do is define our period or our frequency, whichever one the script is asking for, so that it makes it in the audible range that's close to the resonant frequency of our beeper. And then the second thing that we're going to do is we're going to make a duty cycle of around 50%, right? So if we have 255 as our maximum duty cycle, then 127. That'll work just fine. That'll turn the beeper on. How do we turn the beeper off? Well, it turns out we don't need to mess around with the frequency at all. Instead, all we need to do is just simply take that pulse width, make it zero. How do we make the pulse width zero? Make a duty cycle of zero, which makes it so that our output to that beeper is going to be a zero, a constant zero. So let's go ahead and make some code. Now in the earlier video, whenever we were wiring up that joystick, I made the comment that using one of these proto boards may in fact be a little bit of overkill, and that for somebody without the resources, they might want to stick to just using these flying leads. Well, as you can tell, the flying leads are starting to get a little out of a hand, but we do have only one more device to hook up for our circuit. This is a piezoelectric buzzer, um, and it's got two leads on it. It's a two-lead buzzer, and this protective uh, sticker on here in order to get the buzzer to make a noise, you should remove it in order to expose that small hole. Notice that both on the sticker and on the housing of this particular buzzer, we have a little plus sign. That plus sign is what we are going to connect to the circuit or to the GPIO output that is going to drive the, the, the PWM wave that'll make the buzzer make sound. Well, the way we're going to hook this up, and let me go ahead and disconnect that piece for just a moment. The way we're going to hook this up 
is also being connected to the GPIO bus. So that header. This time the pins are, we're going to connect are a little bit closer to the top of our header up to this corner. Now we need two connections. We need one connection for the GPIO output and we need one connection for ground. Now the GPIO output is going to be connected to pin physical pin 12. And so we look at this, these are numbered of course 1, 2 as we're going down this header, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So that right there is our GPIO 18. And that's what we're going to drive the pulse width modulated signal out of. We also need a ground though, and the ground that's closest to this GPIO pin, just to keep things neat, is pin 9. So we go down the, from the top, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, that pin right there, that is where we are going to get our ground signal from. Now, as I said before, the longer of these two leads, the one that is identified with the small plus symbol that is embossed into the uh, plastic housing, that one is going to be our connection that goes to the PWM signal, the GPIO 18. So we count down from the top, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So that pin right there should be the connection to GPIO 18. Now we also have to connect a ground, a reference voltage for the PWM signal to make sense to this piezoelectric buzzer. So we're coming down from the top here. Once again, we're looking at pin nine, physical pin nine. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine is on the inside row here. And we'll just connect that up. And that is all the hardware connection that is needed in order to get our buzzer or our beeper to work for this joystick. It'll give us feedback so whenever we move the joystick we'll be able to see hear some sound. We're in the home stretch now. All we got to do is write the code to make this beeper beep. All right, and we're going to use the exact same library we used for our switches, that P-I-G-I-P-O, the Pig, pig PO uh, library of routines. So let's go ahead and open up. Let's see, using our editor, we'll open up our joystick.js script. Now, down here, after we have created all the buttons, I'm going to create another object. Um, we'll do a const, and this time we'll call it beeper. And beeper is also going to be a new GPIO object. This time, however, we don't have to define it quite as rigorously as we did with the switches. All we need to do now is define it as an output. We have to pick our GPIO pin, and this is going to be pin 18. It's the one that we connected to physical pin 12. It is GPIO 18 on the Broadcom notation. But now the configuration item, the options, are a little bit simpler. All we need to do is simply set a mode to uh, GPIO, the constant for GPIO output. All right, and that should be all that's required in order to get our GPIO pin uh, to output to that output that pulse width modulated signal. Now there are a couple of things. I'm going to come down here, and right after I output that to the console that the inputs are configured. I'm also going to output something that, that gives an idea of the initial settings for our GPIO uh, for that pulse width modulated signal. Now remember, there are two things that are required for the pulse width modulated signal. The first one is the frequency. That's going to be the audible frequency that we're going to hear coming out of the beeper. The second thing is the duty cycle. We're going to pick a duty cycle of 50% uh, in order to make a beep. And in order to turn off the beeper, we're going to make a duty cycle of zero, uh, which means that the signal will basically be a constant logic zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick console.log just to get an idea of exactly what our, our default frequency is. So we've got frequency is equal to and then we'll do the beeper dot get PWM frequency. 
and that will be able to give us what the frequency is whenever we've uh, created this ob this output object. Let's also do something a console log, and this one is going to be our range. The range is going to be what the highest value, what the 100% value for a, for a duty cycle would be set to. Remember that our integers, whenever we, when we write or define the duty cycle for any one of these PWM signals on a processor, typically what you're given is an integer, somewhere between 0 and 255 or 0 and 1023, some sort of a maximum binary value. We need to figure out what that binary value is so we can set the appropriate duty cycle. So we're going to also do beeper and then we'll do get PWM range. Now, by default, whenever this object is created, it's going to have a constant output of a zero or a one, but it's not going to have pulses going to it. Just in case, though, wouldn't it be a little annoying if we had the, the output uh, of a beeping sound? So why don't we also set beeper and do a pwm write and that pwm write we're going to write a duty cycle of zero so pwm write what it's going to do take as its parameter its argument is the duty cycle so we're going to set it to zero just to make sure that thing is not beeping when it powers up let's go ahead and save it exit it and let's do a sudo node joystick .js. okay now our switch is still working, I'm assuming. There we go. Yes, it is. But there, we haven't actually got it set up to beep yet. But it shows that our frequency is a default of 800 hertz. Our range goes from 0 to 255. Now, what we could do here, let's go ahead and exit this. Go back into our code. And what, what I'm going to do is at the very end here is I'm going to create a function. We'll just call it short beep. All right, and this function, when called, it'll start. I'm going to pick a 4,000 hertz duty, uh, 4,000 hertz frequency. Reason being that that is within the range of what the resonant frequency for this beeper is. If you look at the PIGPIO library of functions, the they're based on certain settings. You have specific frequencies that you can pick. Um, so not all for, you can't just pick any frequency that you want. Those frequencies are set by the hardware. A little bit too much to go into right now, but I just want to let you know that there are specific frequencies we are limited to. You can find that out in the PIGPIO um, documentation. But that said, what we're going to do is we're going to create this little, this little beeper uh, function. So we're going to just do a real quick short beep. Um, in, in, um, to get the, to, we're going to do a real quick short beep whenever this guy is called. So let's see, we're going to set the beeper frequency first. So we'll set, oh, we'll do P, P W M frequency. We'll set it to 4,000 Hertz. All right. So that's the first thing that we're going to do. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to figure out what a 50% duty cycle is going to be. In order to do that, we're going to have to have the range. I'm going to create a, va a variable. I'm just going to do let max duty cycle equal, and then we'll do beeper get PWM range. All right. And that will give us, that will return, we know right now it's going to return the 255 unless we have changed the range, all right? Now, from this variable, we are going to compute the duty cycle. And the duty cycle is, well, since it has to be an integer, let's go ahead and use the math trunk function in order to chop off any fraction. And then we'll do 0 0.5 times the max duty cycle all right and so at this point we figured out what the 50 percent duty cycle is now we just need to write it to our beeper so beeper dot and then we'll do the same thing that we did earlier to set it to to set the duty cycle to zero we'll do a pwm write and then this time we're going to do duty cycle so at this point, what we're going to have is a 50% duty cycle going to the beeper. The beeper at that instruction is going to start beeping. We need to turn it off, though. 
And to turn it off, we're going to use the set timeout JavaScript function. So we'll do set timeout. And if you're familiar at all with the set timeout function, you get past two parameters. First thing you get past to it is the callback function. So we'll do function and put our curly braces here. And what we want to do inside of this function is turn off the beeper. We'll do it whenever by we'll do it by setting the duty cycle equal to zero. So PWM write zero, and that should do it for us, right? Now remember, there is a second parameter that is being sent to the set timeout function, and that's the amount of time. 100 gives us a tenth of a second beep. So that should be the function to just start a beep and stop a beep. One last thing I want to do, and that's in this exit procedure. Whenever we, uh, whenever we want to exit because of the control C, just in case we exit while the beeper is on, it'd be a really good idea not to leave that beeper on once the program stops. How are you going to turn it off? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to just simply make sure that our PWM signals duty cycle is set to zero upon exit. All right. And that way we know that it'll be turned off when we exit our code. Now, one last thing that we need to do, we need to actually make it so that when the interrupts occur, the, the function gets called. And so short beep is the function that we're looking at. And so what I'm going to do is for each one of these interrupts, what we will do is short beep, call that function, and we'll get a 10 second beep whenever you do that. So I'm going to grab this guy, and then we will come down to each one of these functions. and insert the uh, call to short beep. Each one of those interrupts, when the interrupt gets called, will go ahead and beep. Let's see if it works. Let's save it, let's exit it, and let's go ahead and run sudo node joystick. All right, we've got our setup. Now let's see if we get a beep. We do. And there you go, a real quick way to get feedback to the user that they've actually pressed that button.